This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology. I'm Michael Schmidt, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Our colleagues, Petra Levin from Washington University, and our podfather, Vincent Racaniello, are away this week, but Michelle and I are glad that you have joined us for what we hope is some fascinating science. If you like our work, please consider supporting us financially, which you may do simply through the website, microbe.tv slash contribute. Any amount is greatly appreciated. It helps us support in bringing you this cool science. I should also mention that this URL is a great place to locate the Microbe TV store where you can purchase all sorts of merch where $1 from each item purchased comes back to Microbe TV to help support our work. As always, your contributions to Microbe TV are tax deductible as it is a 501c3 nonprofit entity. Well, today here in Charleston, we have Chamber of Commerce weather again. We have 84 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius, and I'm happy to introduce my other co-host today, Michelle Swanson. Hello, Michelle. Hello. Good to see you, Michael. Yeah, it's a lovely day here in uh, northern Michigan. It's like 68 degrees and sunny. Well, that's fantastic. Today, we have two offerings for your listening pleasure, but we are diverging a bit from our routine where we normally go into depth on two manuscripts. Today, Michelle is going to change things up by kicking off by introducing us to a news story from the New York Times that recently reported on climate change, increasing infectious disease risk, and then we'll tear into the data that appeared in the article in Nature that was the source of the story. Michelle, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank New York Times reporter Emily Anthes, whose May 8th article um, brought this to my attention. And this is a nature paper titled A Meta-Analysis on Global Change Drivers and the Risk of Infectious Disease. And the lead authors are Michael Mahone, Alexandra Sack, and the PI is Jason Rohr. They're each from uh, Notre Dame, and they work with collaborators, 17 collaborators from Emory, Yale, Oregon State, and UConn. And I just want to point out um, to our listeners who are maybe thinking about what can I do with a biology or microbiology degree. Jason Rohr's lab, their mission is to improve our understanding of fundamental and applied ecology and public health. And besides being in the Department of Biological Sciences at Notre Dame, they're also part of the Eck Institute of Global Health and Environmental Change Initiative. So microbes are everywhere. Come join us. (laughs) So they were motivated by the question, are particular human activities increasing the global risk of infectious disease among people, animals, plants? So a classic example that shows, yes, in fact, the interactions between us and the impact we have on the environment do increase our risk is uh, the first one I learned about really was Lyme disease. So this emerged in 1976, and 20 years later, it's now the most common vector-borne infectious disease in the U.S. There is a bacterium called Borrelia that um, lives in the blood, feeds on blood. So it, um, its natural reservoir is the white-footed mouse. And then black-legged ticks feed on that mouse and then can feed on other animals and transmit the Borrelia. So we often think about, we associate deer with, um, with Lyme disease, but really deer are just blood supplies for the ticks that then reproduce with the, with the white-footed mouse. So what we understand is that in Lyme, Connecticut, where homes were being um, built maybe closer to wooded areas or within wooded areas and forested areas are cleared for development, that increases the contact between humans and ticks. And that's why we saw the, the spread now of Lyme disease in people. A more recent example that you'll all be familiar with is air travel. So you probably know SARS-CoV-2, the virus, uh, was isolated in the Hunan uh, market that was selling live wildlife. So 
lots of interaction between people and wild animals. And then because we now have planes that take us, you know, across continents, across worlds, we saw over the dreaded year of 2020, it spread all over the globe. What is that frequent flyer program called? One World. And it's really Mm -hmm. one one giant incubator for these for these microbes and it was no different for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So they this group was motivated to understand how the um, certain human activities impact infectious disease risk because they're convinced that that knowledge can then guide public health policy and our resources to anticipate, monitor and ideally reduce the spread of infectious disease to people, animals, and plants. And they were assisted in this effort by a effort dates back to 2000. So the United Nations Secretary General at the time, Kofi Annan, requested and, and oversaw the assembly of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was a collaborative effort of more than 2,000 people across the globe to really study um, global change in the climate. And what they identified is five major drivers, including biodiversity changes, climate change, um, chemical pollution, habitat loss or change, and newly introduced species. To understand how each of those um, global drivers of um, change instituted by people could affect infectious disease, um, They set aside the usual beakers and microscopes that you might associate with um, microbiology research and did instead what's called meta-analysis. So here you take advantage of the published literature and you use statistical tools to really interrogate, are there robust trends and associations with um, particular biological events? So just to impress upon you how powerful this meta-analysis can be, they were able to pull data at, from 1,000 different studies, more than 3,000 observations, 1,500 distinct host pathogen interactions from six continents, including countries that were low-resource or middle-resource countries, and collectively apply their statistical tools to see if there were um, robust patterns that were turned up consistently um, in these studies. So take a look at figure one. They have um, in figure in panel G is a map of the globe and each circle represents where one of the studies was conducted. And then they've color coded them um, to show you what uh, particular uh, features that that study uh, focused on. And it included, for example, habitat loss or change, climate change, biodiversity change, et cetera. So this is a massive analysis um, that they um, performed to then ask, um, how do each of these global drivers of infectious disease risk or impact um, infectious disease risk? And Michelle, before, yeah. while, while you take a breath, uh, I think we're going to see more research like this with the advent of accessible artificial intelligence, mm. because these large language models in AI can screen grab a lot of the data that is in the public literature. So don't think this science is reserved for the ivory towers of well-funded universities. If you have good questions, the AI engines have lots of data. They've they've read the literature. That's what we've discovered. But you got to be careful with these AI engines because you have to check that they have properly referenced their sources. And more and more of the AI engines are giving you that. So As our good friend and colleague would often say, stay tuned. There's more to come from studies like these. And computational biology has really revolutionized um, biomedical research. Well, research of all types, including um, evolutionary biology, et cetera, ecology. Absolutely. So in figure two, they look at the impact each of these five global drivers have on infectious disease risk, and they um, express the effect size um, using a term called hedges G. So that just, that's the on the um, x-axis, and it just is a measure of effect size. And what we see um, very clearly is that biodiversity change and introduced species into a new um, environment um, are the largest, have the largest um, effect on uh, infectious disease risk. 
Also, climate change um, had a measurable effect, as did chemical pollution. And then interestingly, habitat loss or change um, actually protected against um, infectious disease, or re- not protected against, I shouldn't imply that, um, was associated with reduced risk of infectious disease. Well, that makes sense, because if you think about it, the one they talked about is Ebola. If you remove the rainforest where the monkeys are, uh, you no longer have monkeys. And so consequently, the reservoir for the bats and the monkeys are gone. And and so you can actually reduce your risk simply by eliminating that habitat. But that's not so good. Yeah, especially if they, they then migrate. Uh huh. That too. <laughs> in search of. <laughs> in search of yes. a meal, a host. Yes, uh, that is bad. So then they go on and do more detailed analysis where they look at the impact of different subcategories of each of these global drivers, and that's shown in Figure Three. So, for example, um, they show that urbanization actually um, was associated with reduced risk. And we know that from the literature because urban settings typically um, are more apt to have their drinking water separated from their wastewater. So access to a clean water supply. And then also habitat loss means less exposure to animals, insects that, that might be the natural reservoirs for some disease. And then in contrast, loss of biodiversity um, had a higher score here, the Hedges G score, increased risk, as did um, climate change, which they measured in particular um, by a change in the mean temperature. So from this analysis so far, which I'm just covering at a very high level, they could make the um, advise uh, policymakers that we should focus on maintaining biodiversity and minimize climate change and also minimize introduction of species into new habitats um, to Uh, mitigate risk of infectious disease to humans, plants, animals. They then did a more detailed analysis. They looked at um, uh, pairwise combinations of particular human-driven change with different types of pathogens, and that's all detailed in figure four. And what they see, for example, is that chemical pollution and climate change actually have a broad effect on all different types of pathogens, whether it's a fungus or a virus or um, a a parasite with a complex life cycle or a simple life cycle. So in general, chemical pollution and climate change is having some general effect that is um, increasing infectious diseases of all types. And that's in contrast to, for example, um, loss of habitat or change in habitat that had a stronger effect on the type of parasite that was associated with the disease and a weaker effect on size of the parasite, for example. And then um, introduced species into a new habitat that had a stronger effect on zoonotic agents, which again, this is a term for infectious agents that cross from animals into humans, whereas human parasites were less um, affected by introduced species, which again makes sense if they just circulate in, in humans. So overall, this really detailed analysis, again, I'm covering, um, You're covering almost, a lot. almost a thousand papers and yeah, a huge amount of data. Um, they simplified into these pretty easy to study um, graphs and identified certain patterns and principles that we can now apply to thinking about infectious disease risk and then use it to inform our public health policy and efforts to anticipate, monitor, and reduce risk of infectious disease. And in particular, their one, one theme was that we should focus on those forces with the broadest impact, which they found in their really detailed studies to be climate change and loss of biodiversity. So they point out that next, um, what they haven't done yet is to look how these five forces interact. Do they offset one another? Do they amplify one another? Um, That would then help us build predictive models and and set uh, policy goals. And they also, to their credit, acknowledge and address that the strongest predictor today of infectious disease risk remains rural poverty. And Again, we can understand from a large literature that it's lack of access to clean water, ample food, shelter, and health care that are major drivers of infectious disease um, in that population. But we need to be alert that as we lose biodiversity and as climate change brings um, more heat and extreme weather patterns, um, we can expect to see increases in particular types of infectious disease. 
So I, I know the two major public policy issues that came out when I was young were the Clean Air Act as well as the Endangered Species Act. Hmm. And little did we know that those two public policy initiatives were so important. And if you don't think the Clean Air Act is, is vital, consider part of the Clean Air Act. We took lead out of gasoline and lead poisoning still is a significant issue. But by virtue of the fact that we took lead out of the gasoline to satisfy our requirements in the Clean Air Act, amongst other things, we have achieved a benefit that now this, the data from over these thousand papers actually supports. So this is really illustrating how potentially public policymakers need to pay attention to stories like the one that appeared in the New York Times that made this very elegant nature paper a bit more digestible mm. for our friends in government. Yeah. I also want to point out another um, exciting advance in science over, over the last few decades is that I think a lot of people have kind of the caricature of a science as somebody that's in a white coat and glasses and just staring at their bench and, you know, completely caught up in their own ideas. This is a collaborative study, as I said, from six different institutions, five different institutions, yeah. 20 different colleagues bringing different expertise. And again, they were building on data that was um, led by the United Nations um, Millennium Ecosystem assessment, assessment that was involved 2,000 people from across the globe. So, um, yeah, computers are wonderful things. They help us communicate and collaborate um, and do meta analysis where you can actually look at thousands of observations and more than 1,500 distinct host pathogen interactions. No lab is able to do that on their no. own. No. <laughs> and, and this, and it should be pointed out that. This paper is the consequence of 25 years of research by investigators, and they put it into the peer-reviewed literature. So as you're checking the literature and the stuff that you publish, make sure your references are right when you finish the reference section. I just reviewed a paper for an unnamed journal and the references were all wrong. They, they got out of sequence. And you can understand how an author can accomplish that. But I'm one of these anal retentive folks that still checks to make sure the, the numbers correspond to the right reference. Well, they're lucky to have you as a reviewer, Michael. Better to find it out from the reviewer than uh, yes. once it's published. <laughs> that, that is indeed the case, Michelle. So what will you share with us today? I have a really cool paper. It's a bit disturbing but it's got a great title. And you know, I'm a sucker for a great title. <laughs> and so here's the title. When the Trojan horse is unable to reach inside the city, investigation of the mechanism of resistance behind the first reported cephidericol resistant E. coli in Canada. Now, this paper appeared in the May 2024 edition of the journal Microbiology Spectrum. So it's an open access paper. And it was authored by a group of Canadians. Uh, the first author is Kevin Barker, Gabriel Rebeck, uh, Ken Fokradian, uh, Clayton McDonald, Michael Mulvey, and Laura Madisey. And they are from various departments of Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. They are also from Public Health Canada which is an agency of Canada that is the national laboratory, our CDC equivalent, that is located in Winnipeg, Canada. So it's, it's sort of very north of North Dakota, for those of you geographically challenged. Now, this story is unfortunately one that is all too, too familiar to regular listeners of TWIM. The human race develops a new anti-infective to aid in our battle against microbes, only to all too quickly learn that the microbes that we are attempting to control have already developed a workaround. The antibiotic we're going to be talking about today is one of the new ones. It was only licensed in the United States in 2019, and its generic name is Cephidericol, or more simply, 
and that I'm going to refer to it is by its branded name, which is Fetrosia. And it's a bit of a mouthful. But, it's a mouthful. But as you might guess, Fetrosia is a hybrid name that offers to the prescribers insight into exactly how this novel antibiotic is designed to work. The first part of the name, Cephedrical, the generic version, teaches us its mode of action, which is based on the structure of a cephalosporin, a beta-lactam class of antimicrobial. The cephalosporins were originally derived from the fungus cephalosporium, where this class of antimicrobials have been actively pursued now for what, 50 plus years, Michelle? Mm. At least. And there are a large group of bactericidal antimicrobials. I think we're past the third generation cephalosporins. We're well into the fourth and fifth generations. And they work principally through their four-membered beta-lactam rings. The beta-lactam ring binds to the penicillin binding protein of the bacterium, resulting in the inhibition of cross-linking, or simply the drug prevents the peptide bridge from forming as the cell continues to grow. And what literally happens is they burst from the osmotic pressure of growth. If you haven't ever seen this happen, I'll drop a video from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute into the show notes for you to see how E. coli, when exposed to beta-lactam antibiotics, explodes from just seeing them. The second half of the generic name, Cephidorocol, is a siderophore motif, which we've talked about siderophores in the past on, on TWIM, and it has a catechol moiety on the three position that serves to effectively steal iron from wherever it can steal it from, and it specifically chelates ferric iron. And it does so because it binds at much higher affinity oh, than the, its competitors. I think it's on the realm of 10 to the negative 52 mm. is its affinity constant. Wow. And this then facilitates the delivery of this hybrid, if you will, antimicrobial across the outer membrane of gram negatives. And if you recall your antibiotic lectures, the beta-lactams traditionally work best against gram positives because they don't have the outer membrane. And so it was always hard to get beta-lactams to really work in gram negatives. But this one takes advantage and it effectively gets across the outer membrane of the gram negative bacteria using the iron transport systems. Sneaky. The bactericidal activity then manifests by this hybrid drug results from the beta lactam ring of the hybrid binding to the penicillin binding protein, which then results in the inhibition of further cell wall biosynthesis, ultimately again causing the bacterium to explode. So, this is a bactericidal drug in a gram negative micro. And I'm now, thinking this is where the Trojan horse in the title this comes is, from. It, it, again, the brand name of this drug is Fetrosia. So iron Trojan horse, folks. And you see it's a play on words that helps, I, that the iron helps to sneak this drug into gram negative cells. Now this drug is only available as a parental or an injectable cephalosporin siderophore conjugate. As I said, it was approved in 2019 by the U.S. FDA for only the treatment of adult patients with serious infections where the indications were either a chronic urinary tract infection or hospital-acquired and or ventilator-associated bacterial pneumonias, which they abbreviate HABP or VABP, which are really challenging to treat as often they are caused by susceptible gram-negative microbes, uh, such as Acinetobacter baumani complexes, uh, resistant E. coli, Enterobacteria cloaceae complexes, Klebsiella pneumonia, and just for good measure, Pseudomonas comes in and causes problems for these folks. So like some other beta-lactam antibacterial agents, the Fetrosia was active against carbapenem resistant and multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria. So this is a really 
promising antimicrobial that we can act, add to our uh, formulary to treat these especially uh, resistant bacteria. And just to emphasize that, it's because it is so good and so precious that the, the um, usage is limited. Yes. If, if we use it for everyday garden variety infections, we're more apt to increase the risk of resistance right. emerging. So it's that rare use is not because it's got some terrible side effect. It's because it's so precious. <laughs> yes. And one last final piece of background before we get into the meat of the paper. Bacteria have at least three mechanisms of resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics. The first falls into the category of molecular grenades. Here, the resistant microbe makes a potent beta-lactamase, or an enzyme, that is exported out of the resistant bacterium, literally for the good of the community, where the enzyme or the grenade goes off, destroying the active component of the drug, namely it breaks the beta-lactam four-membered ring, forming a metabolite that can no longer bind to the penicillin binding protein of the resistant bacteria. So they continue to live long and prosper. And the ones that don't have the, uh, they, they just live. The beta-lactamase enzyme resistance trait is the most common mechanism of beta-lactam resistance in gram-negative bacteria. The second mechanism I'll refer to, this is the yin-yang approach to resistance, where the cell has either reduced porin expressions, and porins bring things into the cell, the consequence being reduced uptake of the drug by the resistant cell, or the alternative where the cell has been altered to literally pump the drug out as fast as faster than it can find its target, namely the penicillin binding protein. And the final mechanism of resistance that many microbes possess against beta-lactam antibiotics is through target modification of the penicillin binding proteins, resulting in a lack of ability to interact with the four-membered or beta-lactam ring, thereby negating the effect of the drug. You know, the drug just can't interact with the penicillin binding protein, and the resistant cells continue to effectively make cell wall. They live long and prosper, and you still have the infections. So now on to the paper. I'm going to continue to use the branded name uh, to give you the picture of how this drug is getting into the cell. So Vitrosia, or this Trojan horse anti-infective, is transported into the cell, for the cell sees it as it's carrying a necessary trace metal, iron. I should also point out, as do the authors, that resistance to Vitrosia is poorly un understood and has only been recently described. And, you know, this is really troubling to me since the drug was only licensed in the U.S., since 2019. Now, the makers of Fetrosia also offer that this drug is stable against all classes of beta-lactamases, and there's at least four distinct enzyme classes of beta-lactamase, including the dreaded serine carbapenemases, as well as the class of metallo-beta-lactamase, which are these VIMs, IMPs, and NDMs. These are the bad bacteria that any infectious disease docs fears their patients are going to get while hospitalized. Now, Fetrosia is also active against microbes that possess upregulation efflux pumps, the yin-yang effect, as well as against porin channel deletions that limit uptake. So as you can imagine, when resistance emerged so quickly, folks were stumped. Now, in the manuscript, the authors describe for us a single case report of a patient in Canada who had recent travel to India who now harbors three E. coli isolates, one resistant and two susceptible to the Fetrosia. Two of the isolates are highly similar genetically, allowing the mechanism of resistance to be described more closely. And I think you can guess what they did. They did whole genome sequencing in order to compare and contrast. Now, this is the power that we have in 2024. As, as you know, when Michelle was describing Kofi Annan's quantum leap of 
looking at all of the things in the paper that we just discussed, we didn't have these tools. They also point out in their manuscript that this is the first resistance case reported in Canada where the drug is not even yet approved for use. And as you might imagine, bacteria have no concept for borders or passport control, where now the nation of Canada is observing resistance to a drug whose use case is for extremely drug-resistant gram-negatives for which we have so few medications that we can offer those suffering. The other background bit is that um, he had been hospitalized for six months before he immigrated to Canada. So he was undergoing a lot of um, antibiotic treatment during that period. He also has diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So, And the big one is jaw cancer. Uh, because as you know, the way they often treat jaw cancer is with radiation. Mm. And so the oral cavity is full of lots of gram negatives, and we have no idea. Uh, This individual was from the Punjab province of India, where he, during his hospitalization in those prior six months, he received a number of oral antimicrobials in the time leading up to his immigration to Canada due to his need for advanced cancer treatments. The the authors also commented that they were unable to verify, but do not believe that he received any prior exposure to the Fetrosia. While he was hospitalized in Canada, he received another beta-lactam, ceftrioxone, and a macrolide that targets protein synthesis, namely azithromycin, which were prescribed for the community-acquired pneumonia he had caught. Why this matters is that often the genes for resistance traits are packed into extra chromosomal elements or even into the chromosome. It's sort of like that umbrella I routinely leave in my luggage just in case it rains while I'm traveling. So the microbe carries the genetic burden of resistance genes as long as they don't significantly impact on the fitness of the individual, where then natural selection simply favors the selection of individuals with lighter luggage or without the genes. So our 77-year-old gentleman returns to the hospital one month later with complaints of profound weakness and confusion, which had worsened over two days. And as an aside, he had severe hypercalcemia, which is a consequence of his head and neck cancer, which was improved through the administration of the pamadronate And that's used to treat high levels of calcium in the blood, which may be caused by certain types of cancer and IV fluids. They didn't give him an antibiotic to treat his hypercalcemia. However, they also cultured his blood for E. coli. And they found E. coli both in his urine and his blood. And the admission screen was positive for one of these scary bacteria, namely a carbapenemase producing enterobacterium E. coli that was one of these uh, CPEs that the CDC in the United States has on our hit list of things to eliminate. Now, the infectious disease team who was treating him deemed that this uh, CPE was community acquired. They treated his UTI with phosphomycin which is not a microlide, what you might guess, but rather a member of a novel class of phosphonic antibiotics that are bactericidal through their ability to inhibit yet another aspect of bacterial cell wall biogenesis, where it works by inactivating the, the carrier of the prepeptidyl glycan moieties. It's UDP and acetyl glucosamine or it's a product of the mirror aging. They reported that when they treated him with the phosphomycin, they saw initial clinical improvement, and then they initiated what they always do in the hospital. They initiated antimicrobial susceptibility testing, where they learned that the microbes, after they were worked up, were indeed the scary ones, XDR, NDMs, which is one you never want. They found the CPE, 
And of the three microbes that they isolated, the first isolate was only susceptible to phosphomycin. The second isolate was a multidrug resistant enterobacteria alias, uh, multidrug resistant that was carbapenem susceptible. And the third isolate harbored OX48 and was also a CBE. But the good news here is it was susceptible to phosph phosphomycin and the common drug used to treat UTIs, which is trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole. All three of these isolates underwent whole genome sequencing where they learned isolates one and two belong to sequence type 167 with only one isolate harboring the beta-lactamase gene, NDM5. Now, why does the sequence type matter? Well, it has to do with the previous and limited case reports were resistant, resistance to the new drug, Petrosia, has been described in these ST167 clones, which coincidentally are associated with increased copy numbers of the beta-lactamase ND5 gene, which, as well as a penicillin binding protein, penicillin binding protein 3, that has an insertion mutation, and wait for this one, an iron catecholate outer membrane transporter mutation. Now think about this drug in its name, Fetrosia. We hit the trifecta here. We, we have pumps, we have binding, we have iron, and it, it just points out that they really just stumbled into something pretty significant maybe helping us to begin to understand the mechanism of how resistance to Fetrosia is, is being promulgated. They also point out that there has been an association with penicillin binding protein and SIRA, but in their isolate sequence, there's uh, four amino acids, uh, tyrosine, arginine, isoleucine, and asparagine insertion mutation in penicillin binding protein uh, number three, and the SIR-A deletion were not unique to the Citrifocor or Petrosia resistant isolate, which was isolate number one, if you're following along. And so they also found, and, and this is, I think, the biggest finding, they also found an iron transport region downstream of the NDM region which may be contributing to the Fetrosia resistance. This is a big region of, of DNA. It's 7 KB, and it contains proteins for both an ABC and iron transporter, both an ABC and iron transport permease, and an iron sulfur-containing protein that led them to then hypothesize that this special set of genetic circumstances may then act as a competitive iron transport system, testable hypothesis. You can knock it out and see if now the bug becomes sensitive to Fetrosia because the competitive iron transport system may turn off the transport system using to sneak the Fetrosia into the cell, or it could facilitate iron acquisition out competing the system associated with the uh, with the Fetrosia, or simply transport. Or the final one, it may be an operon that regulates the system being used by the Citrophor or the Fetrosia associated transport system. Yeah, and so, Michael, as you point out, this they generated a lot of really feasible, testable hypotheses, but to the author's credit, they did not sit on this observation no. until they did all the mechanistic studies because they recognized there's public, uh, public health implications. We want to let people know that this has arrived in North America, and here are some um, molecular hallmarks of the clone, so we need to keep an eye on this. And they rightfully offer to the readers that further proteomic and expression studies are required to test these hypotheses. It's, this is not going to be an in silico one and done. They, they have to go out and doing it. So that's, as Elio often said, that's pretty much the story. It's bad news, but good news, because we now have weeds to chase. 
This paper describes the first reported case and fully characterized isolate of Petrosia resistance within Canada. And it was found in a high risk clone, SD167. This is also the first report of a possible association of iron associated region within the ND5 region that may be required for Petrosia resistance. Again, fully testable. And finally, this drug is not even used in Canada. And with the microbes packing resistance against it, just in case, they're like me bringing that umbrella in my carry-on. But ending on a positive note, Petrosia resistance remains rare. And this patient, while he had many comorbidities, including the radiation for the, the treating the head and neck cancer, that may have been enhancing the ability of the microbes or the microbial community to remain in the host once he arrived in Canada. So if the ID community is a bit skittish about using Fetrosia in folks with hospital-acquired or ventilator-associated pneumonia, I, I wouldn't be concerned because this was a special circumstance and we now have a good understanding of, of what's going on. So that, that's the story. I also want to highlight this group from Trillium Health Partners in Canada, University of Toronto, and also the National Microbiology Laboratory, um, finished with really gracious acknowledgments, thanking mm-hmm. the patient and their family who kindly provided permission to publish the case report. And they also acknowledge the dedication and hard, hard work of their laboratory staff at the Credit, Credit Valley Hospital and the National Microbiology Laboratory. And they thanked their co-author, um, the late Dr. Michael Mulvey, who um, they credit with incredibly supportive family for countless contributions to the understanding of antimicrobial resistance. The void he leaves behind is infinite, but his critical work and impact within Canada, North America, and globally will live on, and he will never be forgotten. And that is the best tribute any of us can yeah. ever hope for. Your work is a testament to your lives. And it, it was it was a really neat paper. And, and as I said, this is a open access and microbiology spectrum. That's TWIM number 311. Yes. If you like our work, consider supporting us financially uh, at microbe.tv contribute. We'd love to get your questions and comments You can write to us at twim at microbe.tv. And Michelle, thank you for your contribution today. And Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michael, and well done. And um, hope to see you soon, both Petra and Vincent. Yeah, we need the gang back. And (laughs) I'm, of course, at the Medical University of South Carolina. And I'm filling in for our podfather, Vincent Racaniello, who's putting the next edition of the virology textbook together. So I think you and I are at least owed a complimentary copy. <laughs> I'd like to thank ASM for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. Uh, this episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. And we'd like to thank Karen at microbe.tv for helping us control this recording. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you again next time. Thanks for listening.